some of the pitfalls that we see in our practice. Uh, uh, excuse me. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it, Dr. Heather. <clears throat> That's great. All right, we're going to talk about some of the uh, pediatric practice uh, and neonatal as well. Uh, pitfalls. Pitfalls means an unapparent source of trouble or danger, a hidden hazard, or a concealed hole in the ground that serves as a trap. So this is the meaning of pitfall. When we start talking about the neonatal period, <clears throat> unfortunately, everyday practice is associated with pitfalls Trials to follow international guidelines, although continuously changing, is warranted to keep up with recent updates in diagnosis and management and to avoid the medical legal issues. This is very important. Actually, uh, we have to uh, change our practice if we are practicing some of these pitfalls. Uh, Preparation. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Personnel and equipment preparation is essential. Before going into the delivery room, you have to make sure that the, the, uh, the infant warmer is okay, the laryngoscope is okay, the batteries are fully charged, that your equipments are, uh, are complete and the personnel are uh, available between the neonatologist and the uh, uh, obstetrician. This is very important. This is very important. We usually ask about the maternal information. So we have to have, if it is multiple pregnancy or a single pregnancy, because if it is multiple pregnancy, I send two of my uh, stars to uh, attend the delivery maternal blood group and RH typing. They always say this as an RH negative mother or RH positive mother. No, I need to know the blood group, ABO, because more it's now becoming more important than the RH. Maternal drugs, if the mother is on medications, sometimes they stop breastfeeding for some anti-epileptic drugs like the Tegritol, which is not a contraindication for uh, breastfeeding. Hepatitis B because of uh, the vaccination immediately after the uh, delivery and the uh, immunoglobulins as well. Group B streptus because I don't know if you have it routinely in, uh, in the Gulf area or not. I think you have it definitely. So these are very important. Transportation of the baby in hospital transport, incubator versus cot, uh, versus cot. Of course, it's better to be transported in an incubator, on a ventilator or ambu bag, definitely on a ventilator. From hospital to hospital, should I tell them to go in their own car or an ambulance? Of course in an ambulance. Ventilator versus ambu bag as well. This is the ventilator. During resuscitation, oxygen. Oxygen is a drug. Oxygen is a drug. So we have to use it cautiously and judiciously. In term and late preterm newborns, 35 weeks of gestation or more, receiving respiratory support at birth, the initial use of 21% oxygen is reasonable. So in term and late preterm, use 21 oxygen, 21% oxygen uh, during gestation. 100% oxygen should not be used to initiate resuscitation because it is associated with excess mortality. I'm talking about mortality. So what we need to do before should be changed now. In preterm newborns, less than 35 weeks of gestation, it may be reasonable to begin with 21 to 30% oxygen. And then subsequent oxygen saturation titration is based on the oxygen saturation targets. Here are the targets during resuscitation. That's why uh, we have to have a pulse oximeter in the delivery room. So in the first minute, 
can be 60, 65, 65, 17 second minute, and so on. Pulse oximetry in the delivery room, if you are anticipated uh, need for uh, resuscitation, positive pressure ventilation, supplemental oxygen, CPAP, or evaluation of sinus. So it is part of the equipment in the delivery room now. Suction. You do suction only if the baby is clearly, clearly obstructed. Warming. Of course, of course, all of us, we have the, the infant warmers, but don't forget the mother skin to skin if the baby is stable. This is very, very important in stabilizing the vital signs of their newborn. Some of the harmful practices in newborn resuscitation, the routine suctioning of the mouth and nose, which will lead to bradycardia. Prolonged flicking of the so, uh, flicking the sole or rubbing or slapping the back when baby is depressed. Routine stomach wash. That used to be uh, 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 a common practice before. We have to change it. Putting the baby upside down for postural drainage. This is very hazardous. We shouldn't do that for fear of uh, sometimes intracranial hemorrhage. You discontinue your station uh, uh, may be appropriate if the station of an infant with cardiac arrest does not result in spontaneous circulation within 10 minutes. Rapid assessment for need for resuscitation and initial steps should be performed within 30 seconds. 30 seconds. We should start resuscitation and initial steps if we decided to start resuscitation. So the assessment should be very fast. Positive pressure ventilation initiated not later than 60 seconds of life constitutes the golden minute. So we have the golden minute, we have the golden hour, and this is very important. The most sensitive measure of response to resuscitation is prompt improvement in heart rate. You, you know that you are doing a successful resuscitation if you find the heart rate improving. Uh, the most important effective step in resuscitation is ventilation. Initiate resuscitation with room air for all newborns. Cordy clamping should be delayed. I, I think it's becoming a common practice now, at least for one minute, if the baby is stable, does not require this station. Look at this. By term, the fetus swallows about 150 milliliters per kg per day of unneeded fluid. He's swallowing almost half a liter every day, a full term baby inside the womb, in utero, is swallowing almost half a liter of amniotic fluid every day. Then after delivery, we cut everything. So we have to be careful with the enteral nutrition. The enteral nutrition is extremely important. After delivery, we should start skin to skin uh, the feeding of the baby, uh, putting the baby on the uh, breast of the mother in the first hour. By, ma by, by most, at most. Are you going to start enteral feeding at 27 weeks gestation? Look at that. Lack or absence of enteral nutrition will lead to diminished intestinal size and weight, atrophy of intestinal mucosa, delayed maturation of intestinal enzymes, increase intestinal permeability and bacterial translocation, and of course, sepsis delays in the maturation of intestinal motility and motor activity, and lack of hormonal response. This is very serious. So we don't have to postpone uh, intranutrition. It should start as early as possible, even in the first hour. If we start early, uh, enter nutrition, it will shorten the time to regain birth weight, to improve feeding tolerance, to reduce the duration of parental nutrition, the hazards of parental nutrition. We are trying to shorten and reduce the duration of parental nutrition. 
enhance the enzyme maturity, reduce intestinal permeability, improves intestinal motility, and matures hormonal responses. Are you going to feed a baby while having a UVC? Yes, no increased risk of enteral feeding as long as the catheter is functioning optimally. Most infants had indwelling umbilical catheters in studies of GI priming and no untoward events were reported. What should we use to start breastfeeding? First choice is the mother's expressed breast milk or colostrum. The warm breast milk should be preferably given fresh. If not frozen or cooled breast milk in the same sequence in which it was expressed. The mornings express breast milk to be given in the morning, the noon, the afternoon, the evening. This is very important for uh, nutrition of the uh, preterm baby especially. Because this is a different uh, constituent, there's different constituents in each uh, breast milk. If not, we go for donor human milk. Last choice is the preterm formula to be used after waiting 24 to 48 hours, trying to get human milk for the baby. New needs who receive an exclusively human milk based diet have significantly lower rates of necrotizing enterprise. This is very important to know. Will you continue enteral feeding on, of a baby receiving dopamine? There is no published literature on feeding policies during systemic arterial hypotension, but there is a study showing that the dose of 10 microgram per kg per minute, both catecholamines were equally effective in raising MAP and lead to a significant increase in standard perfusion. That's a negative the impact on mesenteric blood supply predisposing to necrotizing enterocolitis is not probable. Are you going to continue interfeeding in spite of the decision of blood transfusion? See, this is a study in 2018, and there is no significant association between our packed RBCs, transfusions, and necrotizing enterocolitis. Will you continue enteral feeding during medical treatment of PDA? If the neonate is on minimal feeds, continue to give trophic feeds until the endometrium course finishes. If the neonate is fasting, introduce trophic feeds with human milk, human milk. While there are no randomized controlled trials comparing feeding during endometrium therapy versus ibuprofen, Indirect evidence suggests that ibuprofen may be safer of the two, maybe the safer of the two. Aim to reach full enteral intake by two weeks if the baby is uh, 1,000 grams or less, by one week if the baby between 1,000 and 1,500 grams. So a rapid, rapid advancement there is no difference in the instance of necrotizing interior plots between rapid and slow advancement. Now we move to the pediatric part. We're going to chat on comorbid uh, comorbidity between asthma and allergic rhinitis. Features on uh, the uh, history and uh, physical examination of allergic rhinitis. We'll find chronic or recurrent nasal congestion, allergic faces of the mouth, mid-face hypoplasia, allergic nasal crease, nasal crease on the bridge of the nose as a result of chronic upward rubbing with the palm of the hand, allergic salute, diminished sense of taste and smelling, dental malocclusion, allergic shiners, the dark circles around uh, the eye, multiple infraorbital folds, cobblestone of the posterior pharynx, pale boggy appearance of the nasal mucosa. Here are some of the pictures. This is the cobblestone appearance of the posterior pharynx. This is the cobblestone. I hope it's clear. This is the transverse uh, crease of the nose. These are the transverse nasal crease, this is allergic salute, and this is the allergic shiners. See the dark area around the eye. 
This is the Echinos. This is the Shiners. Shiners. This is the inferior turbinate, and this is the septum. This is the inferior turbinate, and this is the septum. This is very important, inferior turbinate hypertrophy. And this is the enlarged inferior turbinate as well. It's very easy to see the inferior turbinate. You don't have to use the uh, nasal speculum. You can just put the light of the uh, otoscope and look through the uh, of it. You'll see the, and this is very important. Um, the treatment of allergic rhinitis, the cornerstone is the nasal corticosteroid therapy. This is very important. You shouldn't be uh, afraid of it. Don't be scared to use it. It's very uh, safe. It's topical steroid. It's topical steroid. Uh, minimal systemic absorption, if any. And it's approved from two years, starting two years. Uh, and it's simple to use. This is how to use it. The direction should be lateral, not upright or towards the uh, nasal septum. These are the nasal uh, steroids. Checking the time. Um, this is how to use it. You blow your nose, you shake it, you remove the cover, you use it in this direction laterally, and then you exhale. You don't have to close the other side uh, every time. How to diagnose asthma? Asthma can be diagnosed by patient symptoms and medical history. You don't have to use the stethoscope from the start. You have to listen first. Listen for the patient history and patient symptoms. This is how to diagnose asthma, not by the stethoscope alone. If you don't listen to the patient, you will never diagnose it properly. The worst timing of cough will be night cough, dawn time, early morning, and then it becomes better during the daytime. If there is a family history or the child history of asthma or atopic disease, if there is a good response to bronchodilators, if the coughing or wheezing on exertion. Uh, these are the uh, points of history that you should be uh, covering. Um, the duration of cough more than 10 days can never be called. Symptoms occur or worsen in seasonal pattern. Symptoms occur or worsen with, I uh, choose the change in temperature and smoke. Change of temperature going from warm to cold weather atmosphere will precipitate sneezing, coughing, and runny nose. This is not cold. These are the symptoms of allergy. Cold means viral infection, influenza viral infection, but change of temperature from room to room, from outside to inside or the opposite way, this is the change of temperature that will show runny nose, sneezing and coughing, which is the symptoms of runny nose, uh, of uh, asthma or allergic rhinitis. Smoking, this is very important to uh, eliminate smoking as much as you can, of course. And you have to stress it in every time you see the patient in the follow-up uh, visits every, every three months. Uh, recurrent viral uh, respiratory infections, we shouldn't con be confused between the uh, asthma and recurrent viral respiratory infection because in between no symptoms is there in the recurrent viral infection. And usually the runny nose and the coughing is less than 10 days. Gastroesophageal reflux may be one of the important things that you should ask about if you're giving a proper treatment of asthma and the baby is not responding nicely, you should think of another uh, pathology like gastroesophageal reflux. Foreign body aspiration, don't forget it. It's very important. If you see it for the first time, episode of abrupt severe cough and strider, this could be a foreign body aspiration. Asthma management, the treatment, we, we use the controller for, pre, for prevention. This is another stop medicine, reliever rescue medicine. This is a must stop medicine. 
the controller are the ICS, which is topical steroids, safe, and the LABA plus ICS in the children five years or more, and the leukotriene receptor antagonist multiple cast. Almost these are the two uh, controllers that we use. This is the ICS, the cornerstone. Uh, above the five years, uh, we can use the LABA in addition to ICS. Relievers, beta agonists, albitamol, terbitaline, aminophalin is not used. Mucoregulators are not recommended. Severe asthma, we use oral, intravenous, or inhaled steroids, which is the new uh, concept of using the inhaled steroids. When you look at the uh, management of asthma exacerbation, you'll find considered high dose inhaled corticosteroids. This is the GINA guidelines starting 2016. It's been five years now. Inhaled steroids, high dose inhaled steroids is also effective during asthma exacerbation. So it is used as a controller and in high dose, it is effective as a reliever. Oral bronchodilator therapy is not recommended. We do not give oral Ventolin, oral Salvitamol. Slow onset of action, no more, more, more side effects. Uh, you have to check the adherence and the inhaler technique and the environmental exposure every time you see the patient. You have to see the spacer. It's very important. Sometimes it's not working and the patient is not improving and you start to up, step up with the, the, with the drug without seeing the, 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 the technique and the inhaler, the, the spacer itself. You have to see it every time you see the patient and review the response after three months or every three months. This is the asthma control. You have to, uh, every time you see the patient, you to see if it is well controlled, uncontrolled, or partially controlled. It's, it's very important. You don't step up until you make sure that the, everything is uh, correct. And then you see if he is having night uh, waking or he has a limitation of activity or so. Indication of thiophilin, no indication for thiophilin at all. This is very important. Asthma exacerbations, the treatment of asthma exacerbations with thiophilin is not supported or recommended by current clinical practice guidelines. This is starting since 2007 by the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program and Gigina guidelines. There is no thiophilin. I'm not talking about the slow release thiophilin in the, or the adults. I'm talking about the aminophilin used in pediatric age group. Gina guidelines, intravenous aminophilin should not be used. This is very important. Magnesium sulfate, of course, can be used as an inhalation in the first hour, three doses every 20 minutes. Dexamethasone, it's not, uh, uh, it's, it started to be used uh, about five years ago, but now it's not that common. Role of nebulized corticosteroids in asthma, we give high dose. I'm not going to go, so I'm not going through the trials. The, uh, the dose is 800. This trial was 800 microgram half hourly for three doses, which means 2.4 milligram. The other studies use 500 milligram every 20 minutes, every 20 minutes, which means is going to have 1.5 milligram, okay, in the first hour. So with the, uh, uh, the use of body sonide, the uh, discharge will higher uh, with the body sonide group. Combination of nebulized salvitamol and vaticinide should be preferred in the emergency room. Here are the dose of the, um, this is 500 microgram per dose to be given every 20 minutes for three successive doses. This is very important. So the dose is 500, 500 microgram every 20 minutes and can be more even. Uh, the problem of clarifying the parent's dependency on reliever therapy and missing the controller therapy. This is very important. 
uh, we have to uh, explain to the parent that the relievers should be used uh, very, very carefully, very carefully. So uh, I'll show you this curve. With the increased use of the beta-2 agonist, the mortality increases. While with the increased use of uh, ICS, inhaled ICS, the mortality decreases. This is very important. Okay. Yes. I have five minutes yet. Um, high dose ICS given within the first hour of presentation reduces the need for hospitalization in patients not receiving oral corticosteroids. Regular daily low dose of ICS is preferred initial, if that preferred initial controller therapy in children five years of age. <clears throat> the dose is 0.5 to one milligram twice daily. This is the initial dose and the maintenance will be 25 to 0.5 to 0.5 twice daily. Or if the dose is total of one milligram per day, it can be given as a single daily dose. It's available for treatment starting six months. The effect on growth, which is very important, it is not progressive or cumulative. This is the GINA guidelines. The one study showed that it's only 0.7% difference fill adult heights. 0.7% if the baby, if the, if the child is one meter, so the difference will be 0.7 centimeter. If it is an adult, 170 centimeters, it will be almost one centimeters difference. So don't be afraid of using the uh, ICS. Here is the Badisonide trial for uh, four to six years using the inhaled Badisonide. There were no impairment of growth. Unnecessary therapy, antibiotics, tonicolytics, cough syrups, ionizers, breathing exercises, physiotherapy only in lower collapse, documented lower collapse. One of the major uh, uses of the recent uses of the inhaled corticosteroids is in the croup. We use, of course, the L-epinephrine. You don't have to use the racemic. If you don't have it, use the L-epinephrine, the one that we use for intravenous injection. You give 0.5, look at the dose, 0.5 milliliter per kg per dose, 0.5 milliliter of the concentration, one milligram per milliliter. This is very important. Point five milliliter per kg per day, max per dose, sorry, maximum of five ml. This is the dose, this is the dose. When we use the dexamethasone, uh, we give oral dexamethasone 0.15 to 0.6 milligram, maximum 16 milligram. So, uh, if we use, um, uh, this is one of the uh, nice techniques to give the uh, high dose in a small volume. You, got the, you give the uh, intravenous preparation, which is concentrated form four milligram per milliliter in a no, syrup. To we give are it over time. Yeah. Is it possible? Uh, yeah, uh, we can uh, save two minutes for the questions. We are over okay. time. Is that possible? Okay. Okay. Um, Nebulized bedesonide, we give two milligrams, divide two milligrams, two milligrams. These are the doses are larger than we use. So we don't have to use these small doses to treat these patients. Please be careful. The doses are very important. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Adel. Uh, we have really good number of questions for you. Uh, but one of the first challenge actually question is uh, somebody was asking, uh, let me find out here. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, he wants an explanation, a religious explanation or religion view on donor human milk 
in our community? That's the very first question. Uh, actually, when we try, we don't have, of course, the milk banks in our uh, region or our community. And the milk banks are very expensive because the sterilization uh, is, is, is extremely expensive and the uh, storage. And even uh, it's not the best uh, to have a breast uh, bank because it's, uh, some of the uh, uh, the characteristics of the breast milk is lost during this uh, process. But sometimes if the mother is, if I have two preterm babies, one of the mothers is giving a lot of breast milk and the other does, doesn't have any, we show, uh, we, 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 we introduce each other, the, the mothers to each other, and we, we, we have the consent of this mother to give this milk, her breast milk to the other baby. This is, uh, of course, very limited, but I'm, I'm trying to show you the importance of giving breast milk as a priority before you go for the formula. We term formula is the last resort. You give the fresh milk, the cold breast milk, and lastly, uh, and then the, the donor's milk, and lastly, the formula. Another question about asthma, basically about allergic rhinitis. How long do you use intranasal steroids and anti-leukotrienes drugs? Uh, the, the intranasal steroids are safe. The EMT uh, consultant says it is like the uh, antihypertensive drugs. You can use it for life, for adults. For children, I use it at least for a month and see how it goes. If it is fine, we can stop it. But if it is the region, of the, the, the zone of the change of weather, so I can use it even up to three months safely, no problem at all. Another question, what's the highest dose you can use as inhaled steroid in severe asthma? Uh, the highest dose, uh, we can use up to two, three milligrams and no problem at all. Milligrams, uh, okay. milligrams. As you see, as you see in the first trial, it was 800 microgram every half an hour for three doses, which means 2.4 milligram. Okay, um, one, I'll just give that for one more question and I'm sorry, 